Why hello there friends, it's Emma here, the Bookish Princess. Welcome to our final reading vlog of February, our final Feb Regency vlog. Just this morning, the fields were covered in mist and it felt like Mr. Darcy could have walked out of them at any moment. Um, although I'm mixing my metaphors because the Jane Austen novel I was planning to chat with you guys about today is actually Emma. Now that I finished the other Feb Regency prompts, I thought I would reward myself with an Austen reread Really quickly, before we get into it though, I just have to say a quick thank you um, to all of you who ordered a copy of the new Book of Cymbeline. The Book of Cymbeline, the second Book of Cymbeline just came out on Friday, so it's now up on Amazon as an ebook and a paperback. This is of course the second in the series. Um, the original Book of Cymbeline came out uh, in September and it follows the whimsical tales of my cat Cymbeline. She has such um, a great personality and it's just, it just was so much fun watching her grow with the with the season. Seeing her first Halloween and for her first Christmas, there are 18 illustrations that I did myself. If you've been watching my vlogs, you've probably heard me say this uh, <laughs> a couple times, but I am really proud of it um, and I hope you guys will pick up a copy. If you also leave it a review, um, that would be absolutely amazing. It would be a great quick read um, to curl up with on a misty or snowy day. There's some snow in the forecast, finally. February has been mostly mild or else drab like today, but um, I'll see if we get a little bit of snow before um, the month ends. So I have been enjoying my reread of Emma so much. This is the Austin novel that has come up in the rotation. I was just thinking the other day, trying to calculate how many times have I reread Austin's works. For Emma, like I want to estimate around seven or eight. This was probably the seventh or eighth reread. I feel like that's a conservative <laughs> estimate. I first read Pride and Prejudice when I was about 10. And I read Emma, I remember that was the second one I read, maybe a year or so later. And we had this really beautiful little small copy, kind of like my Regency um, editions of Cooper. I don't think it was that old. Although maybe it was, I remember it was missing the last like eighth of the book. So when I got there, I had to go and find another edition to read. So we might not even still have that edition of Emma. It was, it was falling apart even then. But yes, I am very familiar with Austen's novels. I've reread them many times and enjoy them so much. I would never want them to get stale. So I do kind of pace myself. These days I usually reread one Austen novel a year. And after all, there are so many other books to read as, as evidenced by Feb Regency. I remember I'm actually so glad um, that uh, we did this read with Christy and um, Jennifer and Tristan and Stephanie last year. Um, it's been so fun to have that kind of extra push to actually read other Regency authors. It's always been on my list to read more Mariah Edgeworth, Sir Walter Scott, Francis Burney, but I just never really got to it. So the readathon was a great little, great little push. But I have been realizing, um, reading these other authors, who are amazing, I absolutely loved reading um, the different uh, Regency works that I read this month, but Jane does stand apart. I feel like there is something more timeless. She fits in with every age. She truly is a classic, and one of the differences in um, Mariah Edgeworth, for example, the absentee, Edgeworth was describing one of her characters, and it was a beautiful description. Austen doesn't typically describe her characters. Mostly, she just sets them on the stage and lets you watch them. She lets you draw your own conclusions. You hear people say that with great writers, it's about showing, not telling. This line in particular was making me um, think of that. So this is Mr. Elton uh, talking to Emma about Harriet Smith. And Mr. Elton is the vicar, right? He's like the spiritual um, shepherd, the pastor of this local um, community. You have given Miss Smith all that she required, said Mr. Elton. You have made her graceful and easy. She was a beautiful creature when she came to you, but in my opinion, the attractions you have added are infinitely superior to what she received from nature. And then Emma says, I'm glad you think I've been useful to her, but Harriet only wanted drawing out and receiving a few, very few hints. She has all the natural grace of sweetness of temper and artlessness in herself. I have done very little. So Austin just continues on with the scene. She doesn't pause or anything. She delivers this joke with a straight face because when you stop and think about it, a preacher, who is supposed to be directing his parishioners to God to say to someone that you have added these graces infinitely superior to what she received from nature? Like in other words, infinitely superior to what she received from God. <laughs> Like, you can see right there, this is like one of the first times we're hearing Mr. Elton speak, that he is just 
gonna be an absurd character. Austin really doesn't waste a single word. I feel like there's always something new to notice because every single sentence is so packed full of like little hints like that where you actually have to stop and think about it to, to like draw a conclusion of like, okay, what is the, the what is this sentence that the character spoke say about their character? Another passage um, that uh, struck me on this read was this description we get of Miss Bates. And Miss Bates, if you're familiar with Emma, is kind of one of the more annoying characters you might class her with, say, Mrs. Jennings. She definitely gets on Emma's nerves. She might get on your nerves. I would love to hear opinions of Miss Bates um, in the comments. But later in the novel, we certainly see how she gets on people's nerves. But the way she's introduced, Miss Bates enjoyed a most uncommon degree of popularity for a woman neither young, handsome, rich, nor married. Miss Bates stood in the very worst predicament in the world for having much of the public favor. And she had no intellectual superiority to make atonement for, to herself or frighten those who might hate her into outward respect. She had never boasted either beauty or cleverness. Her youth had passed without distinction and her middle of life was devoted to the care of a failing mother and the endeavor to make a small income go as far as possible. And yet she was a happy woman, and a woman whom no one named without goodwill. It was her own universal goodwill and contented temper which worked such wonders. She loved everybody, was interested in everybody's happiness, quick-sighted to everybody's merits, thought herself a most fortunate creature, and surrounded with blessings and such an excellent mother and so many good neighbors and friends, and a home that wanted for nothing. The simplicity and cheerfulness of her nature, her contented and grateful spirit, were a recommendation to everybody and a mine of felicity to herself. How great is that? A mine of felicity to herself. She was a great talker upon little matters, which exactly suited Mr. Woodhouse, full of trivial communications and harmless gossip. So I just thought that was so funny that that, that description of Miss Bates is so sweet, and yet later she's so annoying. <laughs> Although Austin's characters are never one-dimensional, they always have multiple sides to them. The last time I reread Sense and Sensibility, I was realizing that Mrs. Jennings, who is also an annoying character, I was just seeing like she has such a good heart and the way she takes care of Marianne when Marianne gets sick that you know, she's not just this annoying old lady. Yes, Emma is rather hard on Miss Bates, um, especially later when she and Harriet are talking. And Emma's saying, well, I don't mind being an old maid, but I'll never be an old maid like Miss Bates. And I'll never be a poor old maid. <laughs> Emma sometimes gets a bad rap, but I have to say, I absolutely adore her. I think Jane Austen herself said, I've, I've written a character which I think no one but myself will like much. <laughs> I just love Emma's spirit, the way she's so interested in life, interested in everybody around her, the way she gives to her community, she's good to the poor, and the way she cares for her father. I think most of us would fail at that test of character, because Mr. Woodhouse, speaking of annoying characters, <laughs> Mr. Woodhouse, I think, would have been very difficult to live with, but Emma's patience with him and caring for him never flags. Like Miss Bates, Emma is multidimensional. She has both bad and good qualities, um, and we certainly see her character development throughout throughout this novel. Really, all of Austen's heroines, like wonderful as they are, delightful as they are at the beginning, they all have have some kind of character development that is so beautiful to see. Just the plot of this novel by itself is wonderful, but one kind of extra fascinating layer of Austen's novels is when you set them against her own background of her own personal life, what we know about it. You have the contrast um, between Emma, who is handsome, clever, and rich, um, and Miss Bates, who is a poor old maid. And as far as cleverness goes, Jane Austen herself obviously had no shortage of that. <laughs> but in terms of age and status, like when you kind of try to put Jane Austen on the scale between Emma and Miss Bates, she obviously is gonna be towards Miss Bates. She never married. I think like Elizabeth Bennet, she could say she was a gentleman's daughter, but certainly she was not affluent. And she and her mother and her sister, Cassandra and Martha Lloyd, whose cookbook we have, you know, were relying on income from Jane Austen's brothers. So when you're reading Emma talking about how, you know, what it would be to be a poor old maid, um, you know, you have to think about the fact that Austen was, in a sense, writing about herself. But I just love Austen's love for her character. The fact that Emma is, like, above her on the social scale and that she, she gets the happy ending of, of marrying her, her Mr. Knightley, like, does not poison Austen against her at all. I feel like that has become a very modern thing. It's like we don't want to write happy endings anymore. But I love happy endings. And I feel like the work that you have to put in 
to get to a happy ending, to get to a cheerful outlook, it is way more work than to just spin up a sad ending or a depressing ending or to just fall into a depressing outlook on, on life. There was one other line um, that comparing it against Austin's own life um, was kind of funny and you wonder what her family would have thought when they read it because um, one of Austin's brothers, Edward, was adopted by a rich like aunt and uncle, rich family relation. They were childless so he became their heir. He took their name and like he still kept in touch with his you know biological family. In fact Chawton House was right near one of his estates. It was a cottage on one of his estates. Um, that was where Austin lived at the end of her life. So it obviously was incredibly beneficial to the whole family that they, in a sense, gave up one of their children. But that exact same scenario is played out in, um, in Emma, in the character of Frank Churchill. He is the son of Mr. Weston. Um, Mr. Weston's wife died when he was young and uh, his wife had rich relations who had no children of their own, so they offered to adopt the child and instead of a Weston, he became a Churchill. So Mr. Weston doesn't see him there often. This is Emma's sister, Isabella, talking about um, Mr. Weston and th the fact that he gave up Frank Churchill. I have no doubt of his being a most amiable young man, Frank Churchill, but how sad it is that he should not live at home with his father. There is something so shocking in a child's being taken away from his parents and natural home. I never can comprehend how Mr. Weston could part with him to give up one's child. I really never could think well of anybody who proposed such a thing to anybody else. So you have to wonder, like, when Jane Austen's brother, Edward, read that, what did he think? Or Jane Austen's mother, who, who gave up her son, Edward. Like, it's just so fascinating. Speaking of Frank Churchill, this is spoilery, so there's, there's a warning. There's a little spoiler warning for you. But um, there's a point in the book when the character Jane Fairfax receives a piano. It's a, like a, it's a mystery gift. She doesn't know who sent it and everybody is speculating, was it Mr. Dixon, was it Mr. Knightley, was it, you know, who was it? And of course, in the end, I already gave the spoiler warning, um, we find out that it was Frank Churchill. On Valentine's Day, I was doing a little research and reading up about um, Valentine's Day and the Regency period because it was celebrated. People sent notes and poems and handwritten, hand-painted letters. In the book, Emma and Harriet collect a little um, notebook of riddles and rhymes and, and like, lots of funny little um, sayings that they collect themselves. The riddle from Mr. Elton becomes a very important plot point. So they would have been sending riddles like that on Valentine's Day. And um, this blog post that I came across was speculating that maybe Frank Churchill sent the piano to Jane Fairfax on Valentine's Day. And there is some evidence of it. Like we hear that Frank Churchill was in Highbury and, and like seeing Jane Fairfax and um, you know, went to London to get his hair cut. <laughs> but it turned out it was to get the piano. And that was, we hear, around the, the beginning, the first fortnight of February. So I just thought that was such a fascinating observation. I had never even thought of that before, that it could have been a Valentine's Day present. Anyway, I've not quite finished my reread yet, although I'm sure I will have no trouble finishing it. It's going to be a fairly Jane Austen-y week because I'm going to make um, one of the recipes from Martha Lloyd's cookbooks. Yes, but February is almost over, already getting ready for March. I did post my middle grade March TBR. Um, lots of fun children's books I'm hoping to revisit next month.
I've got my Chotten House apron on. I bought this at Jane Austen's house in England years ago. And it seemed appropriate to use today. We are going to attempt to make Martha Lloyd's recipe for a thin cream pancake called Choir of Paper. Apparently in the Regency period when paper was delivered, they would use a bunch of sheets of damaged paper to try to, you know, pack the good paper. And it was usually like 20 all pressed up together and it was called a choir. So this is going to be a stack of very thin, paper thin pancakes all um, in a row. We're gonna give it a try. It was just Shrove Tuesday, Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday, and in England they call it Pancake Day. So who knows, maybe Jane Austen herself, Martha Lloyd, the Chotten household made a choir of paper to celebrate Pancake Day. So I've had to substitute a couple things and I am having the recipe because I'm sorry Martha Lloyd, I don't have eight eggs to spare. Uh, but we start with a pint, in my case, a cup of cream. The order these recipes are shared in, it just says take a pint of cream, eight eggs, leaving out two whites. Like she jumps right into it and then later says that the, the butter should be melted in the cream. So. I'm gonna just warm the cream slightly and melt my half a quarter pound of butter. <laughs> the measurements in these are definitely um, an adventure because, you know, it's not quite like our measurements. It often just says like a pound of butter and that sounds like so much butter. I think that a lot of these recipes, it was made for the whole family, including any servants in the house. Um, so I think they often were cooking for large groups. But if I'm doing anything wrong, you'll just have to forgive me because I'm not an expert cook. Not even in modern times am I an expert um, cook. When we go back to Regency times, I have absolutely no idea. Okay, hopefully that will melt nicely for us. So Martha says, take to a pint of cream, eight eggs, leaving out two whites. Three spoonfuls of fine flour, three spoonfuls of sack. So sack is apparently sherry, but I don't have any sherry. The only alcohol I have in the house is this uh, Tennessee moonshine that I bought on a trip to Tennessee about three years ago. So I thought, you know, we'll give it a try. <laughs> Also, one spoonful of orange flower water. See, sadly, I don't have orange flower water either. Apparently, that's made by, like, literally with the flowers from an orange plant of, like, you know, steeping them in water. And I wasn't sure where I was going to find that. So we're just going to be content with the blackberry whiskey. A little sugar, a grated nutmeg. I do have some nutmeg. I have to grab that. A quarter of a pound of butter melted in the cream. Mingle all well together, mixing the flour with a little cream at first that it may be smooth. So making a little roux. That's clever. And then we're gonna butter our pan for the first pancake, but we're not quite there yet. Let me get the nutmeg first. You should only leave out one white because she did eight and left out two, so. Okay, so we want one full egg. And then this one, we're gonna leave out the white because Martha said so. Shoot, didn't do that very well. It's not like a teaspoon or a tablespoon, it's just three spoonfuls of sack. So, we use a teaspoon, should I just literally use, I think I'm just gonna use a spoon. But see, hers would have tasted like orange flower, so I feel like blackberry could be tasty, maybe. We'll see, this could be famous last words. <laughs> I'm just now realizing as I start to add the cream, the warmed cream to the eggs that you should never add hot liquid to eggs because it'll curdle them and cook them. Martha, why didn't you warn me? So I'm just adding the warmed butter and cream mixture. A small amount at a time. This is a very runny pancake batter. I don't know if I should add more flour or, I mean, it's supposed to be a thin pancake batter. There was another recipe I was thinking of trying for some little rolls that sounded delicious, but um, there was a, a footnote that the editor had added that Marcel Lloyd had apparently copied that recipe out of Hannah Glass's um, uh, popular cookbook, which we made a Hannah Glass recipe for Feb Regency last year. And um, she had forgotten to copy in the part about adding yeast. <laughs> So I'm not sure how well those rolls would have turned out if you forgot to add the yeast. Okay, so we have mingled all well together. Isn't that a beautiful way? Instead of mix the ingredients, mingle them together. So now we're gonna butter our pancake pan. 
Butter your pan for the first pancake and let them run as thin as possible to be whole. When one side is colored, it is enough. Take them carefully out of the pan, strew some fine sifted sugar between each, lay them as even on each other as you can. This quantity will make 20. So ours will probably make about 10. So this is basically like stacked crepes. That might be too thin. <laughs> How am I gonna flip that? Oh dear. This is like a, a cross between a quiche and a pancake. Martha! Ow! <laughs> shoot, shoot, shoot! Okay, it has only five layers, not um, <laughs> not 20. You know, I think some of them came out well. I did have a little taste. The blackberry, it wasn't as disastrous as it could have been. I, I wouldn't call it a disaster at all. But um, luckily I like the taste of blackberry, but you can definitely taste it um, and I'm not sure Another time I would probably just go with the orange. I might skip the sherry, the sack altogether. You know what? I'm, I'm relatively pleased with that. Luckily, um, uh, Mary Berry and Paul Hollywood are not here, so. <laughs> I really enjoy the show, The Great British Bake Off, and now that I think of it, I feel like they did make something like this once. And actually, one of the contestants, I follow some of the contestants on Instagram, and um, Rahul, I'm pretty sure, uh, he recently, for Shrove Tuesday, made, it was like a beautiful cake-sized stack of pancakes. So that maybe was like a, a choir of paper. This is just a, a mini choir of paper. It's definitely much more time consuming to make than I realized. Also, I probably should have been putting the stack in the oven because, because the ones on the bottom get cool so quickly because they're so thin and you're still trying to make more of them. Definitely, yeah, I probably should have picked a less, less challenging and time consuming one. So lessons learned, next time use the, find the orange flower water. Don't use the blackberry moonshine unless you want blackberry moonshine flavored pancakes and, and they're not bad, you know? <laughs> Keep the stack warm somehow while you're making it. I realized why um, there wasn't much sugar in the batter. It's because you're adding sugar between each of the layers. I had a hard time with the temperature and like the amount of butter too. Like I feel like, I used a lot of butter because I didn't want them to stick to the pan and then they came out just a little bit greasy, like maybe I used a little too much butter. This definitely isn't burnt, but um, it is quite, quite caramel colored. I think it's actually a pretty color. Overall, I have to say this turned out much better than I thought. At first I was like, oh my gosh, I can't even make these. Um, but practice makes perfect after a couple. I was able to make them round. I feel like they started coming out better. Very fun to try something out of Jane Austen's kitchen. I have not quite finished the introduction of this book yet, so maybe that is what I'll do next, but I've been enjoying it so much. There's a beautiful photo of um, a quilt that um, Jane Austen and Cassandra and her mother and possibly Martha Lloyd would also have um, worked on. There was a really great note in here though that um, was talking about how when Jane Austen lived at Chawton, so this is towards the end of her life, it was the time when she was writing and publishing her novels, and Martha Lloyd lived in the Chawton household and Martha was really in charge of the kitchen. Unsurprisingly, she did the main meals. Jane had other household tasks. She would take care of breakfast. I think she had the, the keys to the cellar. But they mentioned that when Jane Austen was finishing up Persuasion, both Cassandra and Martha simultaneously went away for several days and Jane had to take Martha's place in the Chawton kitchen to the detriment, as she knew, of her creative imagination. Composition seems to be impossible with a head full of joints and joints of mutton and doses of rhubarb. I think she wrote that in a letter. 
She thought she had finished persuasion and wrote Finis, July 16th, 1816, on what was then the last page of the manuscript, but later on added another paragraph and wrote Finis, July 18th, 1816. However, as her family later remembered, she was still dissatisfied with this ending, feeling it was tame and flat, so she rewrote the last two chapters into the version as now published, finally completing the work on 6th of August, 1816. So it could be said that it was Martha's absence which was responsible for the weakness of Jane's first attempt to conclude her narrative. And it was Martha's return to the cottage which relieved Jane of the interfering household duties and allowed her to re-enter the world of the Elliot family and create Anne's great speeches on the enduring quality of a woman's love. I just thought that was so sweet. I bet Martha, taking care of the, of the kitchen, the joints of mutton and the doses of rhubarb definitely did leave Jane with the time um, at, that she needed to, to create the masterpieces that she did. So excited to have discovered this book and have it in my library and I'm sure I will be trying some more of her recipes. Yeah. <laughs>